Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome to another Peak Prosperity Podcast. I am your host, of course, Chris Martinson. And today, we have the pleasure of speaking with Keith Fitzgerald, chairman of the Fitzgerald Group and chief investment strategist for Money Map Press, where his daily analysis reaches 500,000 readers in 35 countries. Now, I met Keith a few months ago while we were both involved in filming a video documentary for Money Map Press, and that's out and available now. Keith's specialty is in the science of complexity and in nonlinear trends in the financial markets, and his analysis helps individuals and policymakers predict future events and prepare for them. So we're going to talk about some of that today. As well, I really enjoyed, I have to say, I really enjoyed my time with Keith, and I'm excited to have him on the show to discuss complexity, of course, uh, something our economic, financial, and energy systems are increasingly displaying the weaker aspects of these days, I believe, as well as maybe the geopolitics of resources, and hopefully Japan, too, where Keith has both deep personal and professional insights. Keith, thank you for joining us. It's an honor to be here, and I really appreciate it. It's great to be here. Well, thank you. I'm sure my intro was too brief. So for those listeners who aren't familiar with you, can you um, help fill us all in a little more about yourself, your background, and your current areas of interest or focus? Oh, my goodness. Well, I tell you, your introduction was very kind, and I appreciate it very much. I actually began my career more years ago than I can care to remember at the consulting firm at Wilshire Associates. And that's as one of the world's largest preeminent pension fund and financial firms. I learned what works on Wall Street, but more importantly, what doesn't work. And since then, I have pursued uh, interests in global markets and have spent literally my entire career in the major financial centers of the world working with clients around the world. I've been very, very blessed to have enjoyed the path that I have. Uh, complexity, complex systems, those are core to how I view the markets, and that, uh, I think, gives us an edge in terms of how we analyze things because people are looking at them right now in very classic sort of linear sense in that, you know, moving averages are interesting. Boy, we have this stat and that stat. What they don't realize about complex systems is that they feed on themselves and they're self-iterative. And what that means is that very, very tiny inputs continue to cause reaction and action inside the system itself. And many times it's these actions that are, are, are causing much of today's consternation, but nobody realizes that's what they actually are. So let's start there then with this complexity. You know, it, it's presented fairly linearly in the press. You read about it. So the Federal Reserve wants to uh, make employment go up. So what do they do? They lower interest rates. It's like it's a big lever, right? You push on it this way and, and interest rates go down. And guess what? Employment goes up. What you're saying is it doesn't quite work that simply. No, it doesn't. There are all kinds of other inputs that go into it. And, you know, one of the things that they have not yet focused on is that in their uh, massive, what I call, fiscal meddling, because, uh, you know, this is the mm -hmm. greatest fiscal meddling we have ever seen in recorded history. The United States went from being the world's greatest creditor to the world's single biggest recorded debtor ever. Uh, they don't understand that in keeping interest rates low and in stimulating the economy, they, in fact, are feeding the very problems that caused this financial mess to begin with. You know, I have not yet seen anybody other than myself and a few other people argue that this crisis was not caused by a lack of liquidity. This crisis was caused by too much money in the first place, and it's too much money slashing around in the punch bowl that is causing all these problems. Well, absolutely. And of course, we've got 0% uh, interest rates, which were supposed to be temporary, right? What are we, three and a half years into them? And they're arguably not working, although you might try and argue the negative and say, well, at least the world didn't completely fall apart. But here we well, are. Well, that's a pretty weak argument. I mean, that's basically like, you know, uh, airplane fees. They were supposed to be temporary to compensate for gas. Well, guess what? Three or four billion dollars a year later, you know, you can pay five bucks for a pillow, seven dollars if you want a clean one. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's ridiculous abuse of the economic system. What you have to engineer, in my opinion, is the concept of failure. Capitalism works because of success, but people forget that implicit in that uh, concept of success is the concept of failure. And until they start to reintroduce failure and introduce the free hand of risk, the markets are going to do what they were doing now. Right. So with this uh, mispriced money, which is, I think, the root of all evil in, in the financial markets, when money is mispriced, everything gets mispriced, not the least of which is risk. 
uh-huh. uh, risk is horribly mispriced at this point. I, you know, look at what it, you're going to get back for loaning money to the U.S. government for 30 years. And you might say, well, that doesn't really seem adequate. But, uh, you know, that's just beating on treasuries. Uh, talk about maybe, I don't know, the junk bond markets priced where they are or the municipal bond markets or any of the bond markets or equity markets. They all seem priced for some form of perfection. Maybe that's mispricing risk a bit. Well, you know, I think there's a, I think there's a broader issue here, and I've made the you know no bones about the argument that that the reason this crisis, as opposed to any of the other crises we've lived through in the past, is so very painful for so many people, is that the very definition of money is changing, and you can see that in the way they have manipulated interest rates by bringing them down and by keeping the range so narrow between short range and long range, they've created a financial uh, roadblock, for lack of better terms. If you're, a, and here's how this works, is if you invest money, you're assumed to invest it longer periods of time. You earn more because you're taking more risk. That's conventionally accepted financial theory. Well, if you go out 30 years and you're only getting one and a half, two, three percent on your money, if you factor in the cost of inflation, effectively that's a zero investment return decision. And if interest rates on the short term are held so low, what you've done inadvertently is you have theoretically removed the time value of money. Therefore, there is no incentive to invest it. There's no incentive to lend it. The breakdown of the model of uh, borrow short, lend long completely fails. You can't make capital budgeting decisions. Everything from money market funds, for example, where you've got a trillion dollars of assets sitting there, to pension funds where you've got hundreds of billions, trillions of dollars, you can't price those models. Chief financial officers can't budget capital allocation decisions. I mean, it just goes on and on and on, all because they have, by federal policy, now effectively removed time value from the calculation. So without any time value of money, there's no point in investing. And, and to me, that's, uh, you know, the big breakdown here is that it looked like what they wanted to do was was classical financial engineering, economic engineering. They wanted to just apply a jolt of stimulus and have that kickstart the patient. But now that we're this far into it, it feels like it's become structurally embedded and to the point that, A, you know, we're having these sorts of knock-on effects you've talked about where the time value of money seems to uh, have disappeared. So who's investing anymore? It's only investment that's really going to get us out of this in the long term if you believe we're going to go through, you know, more conventional uh, business cycles. We're going to get ourselves out of this. We're going to continue to um, uh, grow. That has to come from productive assets. But it's it, you're making it sound like what we're really doing is um, we've locked the seed corn away and it's getting moldy. Well, I think that's right. I mean, you know, you don't throw good money after bad. And at some point, these guys, uh, you know, and and I will deliberately refer to them as these financial clowns, have got to understand that what they're doing has never worked in recorded history, ever. It's not that it hasn't worked in the last 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. It hasn't worked ever. Whenever you debase your currency like this, the economy eventually fails. Now, that having been said, there is another side of the coin here. So this is not all doom, gloom, and boom. You know, the, the reality of it is that we have had similar inflection points throughout history. We had many of the uh, medieval European banks going bankrupt in the 11th, 12th century. The Roman banks went bankrupt in the 3rd and 4th centuries. We've had failure all over the map. History is littered, as legendary Jim Rogers pointed out to me one day in Singapore, history is littered with the bones of financial institutions. You have to allow failure. And that's where these guys are screwing up. You know, they have, they have said this all gain, no pain philosophy. The problem is, you know, is the patient going to last long enough to make it through the operation? I don't think the patients even get to the operating room. So the chief, uh, one of the chief stumbling points here, you're going to say is uh, bailing out city, bailing out all anybody who's made big mistakes. There is no too big to fail in your mind that that, uh, creative destruction, this is a requirement of the system. And so by circumventing that basic requirement, what kind of a system are we operating in then? Well, it sure as hell is not the free markets that everybody likes to think it is. Mm-hmm. And, and that, you know, to me is extremely disturbing because they have removed the hand of risk from the marketplace and these businesses now uh, have every incentive to screw up because they know that, A, they won't be held accountable for it, and, B, they're going to get bailed out. Now, the problem with that is obviously that this, if, if you're rich, you get a bailout. If you're poor you get a handout, and if you're middle class, you get left out. And mm-hmm. I just don't think that's a profitable way to run the system. They have put so much debt onto this that our unborn great-great-great-great-great-grandchildren could not possibly pay this off. The only way they're going to get out of this 
is to deleverage it and remove it from the system. Well, how would they go about doing that? I, I, first of all, I assume these are not unintelligent people. They've, they've got good degrees. Uh, they've studied history possibly, you know, uh, to as well as they can. And yet here we are. So is there a chance, let's speculate for a second, what were they looking at that, that made them throw so much caution to the wind to, to take so much established history and say, we just, do, we're going to have to uh, uh, go down this path, which is ultra cheap, mispriced money, taking risk out of the system where it shouldn't, introducing additional risk in other places. This is massive, massive financial and dare I say social engineering. Why would they do that? Well, I think you've hit the nail on the head. You know, this concept of they've got great degrees. You know, the people I talk to who are for this and think bailouts are such a neat idea, by and large, are the academics with very little real-world monetary experience. Mm. And they're not stupid. They're not stupid by any stretch of the imagination. So don't get me wrong here. I'm, you know, what I'm saying, though, is that they have very different attitudes about money because they've never actually worked with it. They mm-hmm. haven't run a company. They don't know how a balance sheet functions. They haven't hired employees. They don't know what it takes. And so they don't understand how the money actually moves through the system, except in an academic sense of the word. And if you look at Bernanke, he's a great example of this. He has a Ph.D. He's extremely intelligent. He has gotten his Ph.D. basically on Depression-era economics, and they tried to print their way out of that. Well, what's ironic is that he evidently did not read the part of history where Morgenthau, who was Roosevelt's secretary, uh, Treasury Secretary, got to congressional testimony said, you know, we could have printed all the money in the world and it wouldn't have worked. It didn't work. So why they have gone about this and why this sort of Keynesian economics has become mainstream thinking and is taught in every university today and amongst every widely accepted political and policy dogma is beyond me because the reality of the situation is we have abundant evidence and it grows every day that it actually doesn't well, it's uh, certainly a very popular policy with politicians, right? Because um, it it says spend freely, and then when times get tight, we're going to enable you to spend even more freely because it calls for it. It sort of elevates to moral stature the idea that you need to spend beyond your means, uh, especially during tough times. I, I understand how it how it got entrenched. The mysterious part to me is that I do hear the people who, who look at the current situation and say, you know, there but for the Fed, it could have been a lot worse. At sort of, you know, speaking to the negative. And I don't really buy that because I look at this and I say, you know, for these trillions of dollars that have been injected, both in, in liquidity measures, but also let's be frankly honest about this. There's been several trillion dollars of high powered money injected in. So we've got, you know, two types of, of liquidity in there. And uh, I'm underwhelmed. I am really underwhelmed, and I'm looking at the landscape, and I'm saying to myself, this seems to me like the pressures are growing worse. Sovereign debt is getting more out of control, not less, you know, not under better control. We're not seeing the sort of wipeouts that I would expect to see where the bad debts are going away. They're just sort of being hidden around. There's this mark-to-model stuff. We're just shuffling. We're biding time. Hasn't enough time passed? Well, you know what they're really doing, Chris? They're, they're not just shuffling. What they're doing is rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. I'd rather get off the boat. <laughs> me too. Can we get on with it, please? Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is the thing is, you know, let some of these things fail, you know, because when failure occurs, you have a, an asset redistribution. The faulty assets are, in fact, bled out of the system. The quality assets are assumed by responsible parties. That is the law of capitalism. That's the way it works. So if we think back to the credit crisis and we think back to, uh, you know, what happened in 2007, 2008, they went screaming and yelling to Congress, oh, my goodness, we're going to have to do this or the sky's going to fall. Well, the sky fell anyway. You know, they, they pumped $700 billion into this, then a couple trillion. Well, if the government multiplier that they all these conventional economists talk about actually worked, you know, our economy should be screaming along at 6 or 8% right now, but it's not. And the reason it's not is because it's a complex system and all the pushing and pulling they've done on one end They didn't understand that all these other things would happen at the other end. Too big to fail is not too big to fail. It's too big to survive. We have monopoly laws that we should have been using along the way, but our regulators were asleep at the switch. They're outmanned, outgunned, outclassed at every turn of the road. You know, Wall Street does not want to do anything that remotely resembles uh, rain itself in, and it has no incentive to do so. Now, I think you're being kind to the regulators because there were certain instances where uh, I think they were a little bit more than asleep at the switch, potentially complicit. Um, well, I would agree with that statement. I, I think, you know, there's a very incestuous relationship between Wall Street as regulators and our leaders. And, 
you know, this concept, the insider trading cases, the enrichment that Congress was doing, you know, what they were doing on any other universe would have been tremendous violation of the insider trading laws. And yet nobody went to jail, nobody got punished, they just passed a little law that they'd been trying to pass for three or four years, and only after a 60 Minutes expose did the public get enraged because they figured out what was going on, did they pass this thing. Right. Well, turning now to how we might get out of this, uh, I don't want to make too much of an island nation of 300,000 people. However, I will note that in the case of Iceland, which, again, only had a few billion dollars of losses to contend with, but they chose to uh, stick those losses with the bondholders, where I would, and I think you would rightly argue they belong. Uh, and, and of course, the, the world was reading Iceland, the Riot Act, saying the sun will no longer rise in the east if you do that, your fish will all die and float belly up, bad things will happen, and they did it, and nothing bad seems to have happened. Is that an instructive lesson, or is that just uh, too small of, a, of, an, of an, an anecdote to really be extendable? I, I think it absolutely is extendable, and I think the other thing that's very, very interesting is that if you take a real look through history and you look back to the Asian financial crisis in the 19, early 1990s, uh, we had the advice, we were giving advice to Asia and to China saying you've got to let these banks fail you can't bail them out we were telling them to do the very things that we're now not doing mm-hmm. and so you know it's like is it the pot calling the kettle black I don't know but is it hypocritical you bet it's hypocritical right Right. Well, it, it, it's very attractive thought to me that the bondholders would uh, have to eat the losses because, of course, due diligence, caveat emptor, uh, you know, better luck next time, however we want to phrase that. Without that learning process, there's no, there's no I don't understand how the feedback mechanism is supposed to work. And, and uh, the losses seem to have been shuffled up to all the wrong places. And the only thing I can think of that makes sense to me is that somehow those must have been really dark times. I'm sure when when uh, Hank Paulson was closing the door and giving them his little three page memo on why, you know, he wanted 750 billion. I'm sure they were very worried about the whole system. And and so I want to come back then to what that could have been. And, and I think we start at the beginning of this conversation, which, which is complexity. I truly believe that the system with 700 trillion or quadrillion or whatever the notional value of derivatives is, uh, that, that with that, with the interconnectedness of all the banks uh, across borders, with no firewalls really existing between countries anymore, that the system, is it just too complex to manage? Is that the theme? Is that how I interpret the actions? Because if it doesn't, if the strategy hasn't been panic, I, I, I'm not really clear on what it has been. Yeah, I think, you know, I think that's a very valid question. And frankly, Chris, I don't know the answer to that, but I do know the system. I, I believe the system is overly complex, and the reason it's overly complex is we've tried to build in too many safeguards. And, you know, there are a lot of people who will debate that and who will quibble over what defines safeguard or, or complex or this kind of thing. And they've got very valid points, and I think history is going to simply play this out. And, and again, right up front, I don't know all the answers. I don't, I, I don't pretend to. But, you know, it seems to me that in the interest of financial innovation, we have inadvertently created some sort of hybrid monster and let it out of the laboratory. And if we're going to rein this back in, we have got to remove some of the freedoms that we, in fact, put in place. And I'll give you a good example. The Glass-Steagall Act, when it was put in place, was put in place specifically to prevent banks from double-dealing, insider trading, trading against their clients, selling shares uh, that had no value, all of which are issues today. Every single one of those issues is there today, mm-hmm. and it's there today because in 97, 98, we took down Glass-Steagall, and Glass-Steagall was taken down. That allowed commercial and in, uh, investment banks to combine, and then in 2000, with the Commodity Modernization Act, we removed yet another uh, bulwark or dike or what do you know, what do you call it, blast shield, and mm-hmm. we specifically exempted many of the credit default swaps and exotic vehicles that were traded off balance sheet uh, from regulation. Translation is that our leverage went from roughly ten to one at the end of World War II to as much as a hundred to one coming into this financial crisis, and when that happens, you have excess that has driven everything, not the actual underlying growth. So you've got to get back to the underlying growth. You potentially repudiate all the derivatives. You outlaw these things. If they're insurance products, you treat them as insurance products. You regulate them accordingly. We already have those laws on the books. We don't need all this new regulation to cover it. You know, the government does not have to justify its own existence by passing new legislation. We have to use the laws we've got. And most of those laws, like the anti-monopoly laws, uh, would 
would have prevented the size. The know your customers rules that are in place for every brokerage house, for example, that exists today, had they mm-hmm. been applied to the credit default swaps or those kinds of things, those transactions would never have taken place. We can implement those tomorrow if we had the political will to do it, and we could rein this stuff in instantly. Well, it's interesting, this this idea of the leverage then, uh, which certainly did build up to extraordinary levels, maybe it's backed off a bit. As I understand it right now, uh, European banks were a bit more leveraged even than their U.S. counterparts. And of course, Europe's uh, suffering under a variety of, of uh, issues around that right now, the leverage for sure, uh, um, a somewhat sclerotic bureaucratic method, uh, which uh, doesn't yep. really allow a you know fast response to crises, you know, like the Federal Reserve, just what they do, make 21,000 separate loans to everybody from Dexia to the uh, Bank of South Korea uh, during the height of the crisis, so they've they've got that to contend with. Plus, they've got unworkable math and uh, and social programs that are now coming due. There's a variety of of pressures uh, pushing there right now. How do you see Europe playing out, say, over the next six months? Well, you know, it's interesting. I at the beginning of this crisis, I said, you know, Greek should be Greece should be kicked out of the union if they're going to demonstrate that the euro has any kind of stability and they're going to keep you know the the uh, enforce their own laws for inclusion in the EU. Um, but they chose not to do that, and now Greece is going around hat in hand begging for an extra two years. Well, an extra two years for what? They're still going to fail. They're still going to lose their sovereign standing, and I think they're still going to exit the EU. And the EU economy is very quickly, if it hasn't already, uh, going to develop serious structural problems, and we're going to see it develop into an economy of the haves and the have-nots. And, you know, whether they can firewall this off or not, I don't know. You know, there seems to be lots of talk. Super Mario Draghi says we're going to do anything to save the euro, yet Merkel says we're not paying for it. I mean, it's the same old line, and we've seen it for four or five years now. They have meeting after meeting. They announce new solutions every week, and nothing actually gets done. You know, this is where the free hand of the market steps in and says, you know, gee, guys, we're sorry, but time's up. And I think that's approaching. And when that... Uh comes forward, do you see it? Well, here's how I see it. Uh, what we saw in Greece is just a harbinger of what we're going to see elsewhere. And so uh, eventually the market manages to figure out that, well, Spain, under any circumstances, can't possibly pay back 10-year debt at 7% when their economy is going in the other direction exactly, in negative territory. And and so the bond markets ultimately do, uh, they lay down the law, as it were. And I don't think the ECB is, is set to move quickly enough with enough firepower to really offset that. The only thing I, I've really speculated on is that I think the world central banks, by which I mean the Bank of Japan, England, Federal Reserve, and the ECB, all have to kind of get together, hold hands, sing kumbaya, and do something really magnificent. Again, stopgap papers over something, which is that we have a multi-decade credit bubble, which uh, fundamentally has to be unwound, and somebody's going to have to eat those losses. We just haven't figured out or decided who that is yet. Well, that's, now you're getting to the heart of the matter, which is, you know, eventually somebody is going to have to take the loss. You, you cannot operate with nobody taking the loss for long, yet that's exactly what they're trying to do. Mm-hmm. And uh, so those losses, uh, obviously, they, they start somewhere. Bond markets are good places as any for that to sort of kick off. Well, and ironically, you know, you, you talk about complex systems. You know, what's facilitating the bond market, and the only reason they can even get this paper and they can have these rates move the way they are, is because the institutions are allowed to trade these credit default swaps. And so they are trading all these credit default swaps ostensibly as insurance against the failure of sovereign debt, when in reality, if you look, for example, at the J.P. Morgan trade and the whale, Bruno Ixil, mm-hmm. you know, they were speculating on this stuff. So, a la, the bottom line is, if the government says, we're not going to bail you jokers out, then the credit default swaps instantly become worthless. There's no incentive to bet on them. Those stop trading. You can rein them in, and we all, you know, we ground out the excess. Well, that's, so uh... the bailouts are simply enabling Wall Street to do its thing. <laughs> I'm I'm shocked, shocked to find that happening. The one way bet you can't you you almost can't lose. Well, uh, that's how Wall Street likes it, I guess. Uh, oh yeah, they're they're like they're like the house in Vegas. As long as the odds are on their side, they'll play the game all day long. But if you mess with their candy basket, they're not going to like it. No, no. Well, I I like to make my bets uh, on the long term sweeps of things. You know, th- markets can remain irrational longer, and you can remain solvent and all yes, those other. Absolutely. 
uh, aphorisms like that. But the big trends have always been my my uh, friend as, as we go forward. And so uh, another trend that I really caught my eye that I, I just I'd love to get your your input on to help me understand this a little better. I tracked Japan. I actually um, pinged Japan earlier this year as my dark horse candidate to be the the black swan of 2012. And maybe that's a little premature. Um, it might be 2013. But what I was tracking was this unbelievably gigantic switch that's happened where uh, Japan had this uh, export-driven economy, used the surplus to fund their current account surplus, which then enabled this extraordinary amount of of debt uh, and deficit expenditure, debt accumulation at the national level. And watching Japan um, tip uh, over into uh, a trade deficit this year and seeing their current account uh, erode to hover around zero felt pretty profound to me. And of course, we have all of these other uh, things that are piled on there with the demographic shift, with uh, the largest uh, pension uh, funds uh, now selling uh, some of those uh, wonderful Japanese bonds in order to uh, fund redemptions uh, and payouts and things like that. So I, I just, I, uh, I know you do um, tell people about your connection to Japan. I was really impressed to hear uh, how deep that ran for you. And then I'd love to talk about what you might think um, is really on the horizon there. You bet. Well, you know, as you know, it's, it, Japan is a country that I love deeply. It is my other home. Um, I have lived there at least part-time every year for more than 20 years. I'm married to a Japanese. Uh, we have a home in Kyoto. So, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm well acquainted with the on-the-ground perspective. And, you know, I, what I see over there is greatly disturbing. You know, every year here in the investment world or in Europe, I hear some analysts saying, well, this is Japan's year. It's going to come back. Oh, boy, this is going to be great. But the reality situation is that Japan is never going to regain its prominence. The demographics are working against it. Thirty percent of the population is literally going to die by 2050. Uh, mm. That has tremendous implications in terms of education, brain power, earning power, earning capacity. Uh, right now, the debt is at 250 some odd percent, just government debt. If you factor in private and corporate debt, you're looking at almost 500 percent of GDP. So, the, you know, really in recorded history, uh, we haven't seen this before. And Japan has no immigration policy, so they can't import workers. They're an export-based economy, and that's a the decision they made shortly after World War II, that they would mortgage their future on exports. And so far, it has worked, but then you hit the 90s, and boy, it kind of broke down. And, uh, you know, we're, we're repeating those mistakes right here. So, you know, I'm not very optimistic on Japan's recovery, and I certainly don't think it's going to return to its glory days. Its neighbor, China, on the other hand, is the dominant player this century. Absolutely. How do you explain uh, the strength in the Japanese yen, which uh, just by fundamental basics, we, where we might note things like um, how many of them are being printed up and, and routine efforts to, uh, to weaken the currency uh, on the part of official parties over there. Um, how do you explain the, the strength in the yen? And, and uh, secondarily, uh, is it possible that with uh, the Bank of Japan leaning on trying to get a weaker yen, is it possible they might succeed beyond their wildest dreams at some point? Oh, yes. I, I think a weakening yen is one of the greatest trades of this century. And, you know, for folks who are savvy enough to get onto it, that uh, that trade it should be 150, 200 yen to the dollar by the time this is done. Now, the reason it's not so far is because of the EU crisis and the mess in the, financial, in the United States. As the world, you know, as this stuff, for lack of a better term, has hit the fan, it hasn't been equally distributed. And people have run to the dollar and they've run to the yen because those are the only two currencies on the planet that are deep enough to absorb a lot of this liquidity safety run. And that's what's keeping it high. Most of the Japanese corporations that I'm familiar with and having met with a lot of their C-level executives over the years, uh, you know, they need 100 yen to the dollar to even remotely begin to be profitable. And, you know, what they'd like to see is somewhere about 105, 105, 120. In reality, if you factor in the debt, the quadrillion yen that they're opposing, you know, not trillions, quadrillion yen mm-hmm. that they're approaching in terms of deficit and debt, uh, you know, that thing should be 150, 200. And, uh, you know, or maybe who knows what overshoot might bring to that particular situation. It's the, again, though, we have a, a, a structural problem here with the numbers. When I do the math in Japan, we look at it, what they're really going to require in terms of, of domestic savings in order to fund their current 
uh, I would say, embedded level of structural deficit spending, you know, something, a condition the U.S. is rapidly approaching. Remember those trillion-dollar yep, deficits? There's no, there's no question they, they cannot afford the way they're, they're operating now. And the only thing that is saving them is this world rush to own the end uh, as a result of the failure of Europe and the failure in the United States. Well, it, it, once the yen starts weakening, then their their uh, toolbox is not that that deep in terms of how you would defend the yen. You raise interest rates, and uh, by rough calculations I've performed, at about three percent on its interest payments, Japan will be spending a hundred percent of its revenue on interest payments. And so, of yep. course, they've just doubled their their domestic uh, uh, sales tax, and and they're doing other things to try and raise revenue. But those efforts have been, um, shall we say, proven to be. Uh, not quite as robust as politicians ever hope when they raise taxes. And uh, but see, again, this is there. There's the problem right there. Not as robust as politicians hope. Very few of these guys have actually worked with real money. So logically, rather than cutting expenses, they just assume we're going to tax everybody else into oblivion. And we see that here in the United States as well. You know, this concept of of let's just raise taxes on everybody. Well, you know what? I have never seen a budget yet you can't cut 20% out of. So get serious and figure it out. And that's what we don't have the willpower to do any more than they do. Well, yeah, it's become, it's almost like we've lost the muscle memory. Uh, you know, we've been lying yep. in bed too long, and we just don't know how to use those muscles anymore. But we're going to have to at some point. And, and, and I guess you either do it on your own terms while time remains, or you wait until the markets force you. Uh, from what I've seen in Greece, that's a really painful process when you're forced up against the wall, you know, cut half your budget, go. Well, and I think, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people say, we've well, got to go to Greece to see what's going to happen here. No, you don't. You go to California. You know, California is at the bottom of the barrel right now, and the state's functionally insolvent. They're trying to raise taxes. The capital is leaving. It's moving. You know, if you look at what happens, all these people in Silicon Valley, when they make their nut, the first thing they do is move to Nevada. You know, I mean, it's just, it's just you can see there what's going to happen to the rest of the United States, and it is not pretty. Yeah, interesting. And, and of course, the larger backdrop across all of this for me is uh, – is resources. You know, there's a very interesting quarterly report out by uh, Jeremy Grantham where, again, yep. wonderful data, did some really nice work looking at the long sweep of prices and yep. where we really are, noting things like uh, the, the degrading ore uh, yields from copper and other things like that, saying, listen, we're in, a, we're in sort of a structural situation here that, that's big. It's a very, very big story. And against that, you know, somewhere around March, uh, there was a, just a spate of articles that came out in the U.S. that somewhere had this term embedded in them, energy independence. And sort of leading this was this idea that this fracking revolution in both oil and, and natural gas was really going to uh, change the game. And so that's the story. And I, I, I don't know how many articles I had to read that the idea of peak oil is dead. And so how, can you help me square that up with the articles I read this week, which say, uh, the world is considering releasing strategic stockpiles. We're not really happy with oil price where it is. Brent seems to be stuck solidly over 100 and maybe over 110. And, uh, and, and those sorts of oil numbers in the price markets that I'm seeing are really not consistent with an overabundance of oil. Uh, in fact, they're consistent with something else. Well, yeah, and again, I, I, I will absolutely take issue with these guys. You know, I don't think peak oil is dead at all, and I think fracking – is going to have massive unintended consequences, some of which we're seeing now, like the damage to the water table, the diversion of resources that we could be using to grow food. Mm -hmm. I think that the industrial damage, the planetary damage, these are all things that we are beginning to have glimmers of uh, that people don't want to acknowledge. The other thing that we need to consider, you know, in terms of oil, is that, you know, let's just say fracking worked. I mean, just for kicks and giggles, you know, let's just say it worked and we brought on a huge amount of supply. Well, whoop de two shoes because the world is still expanding in emerging markets in particular at double digit rates. And so unless you're talking about 89, 90, 100 million barrels a day being brought online, there's no reason in the world why prices are going to drop because the demand isn't fungible. It has to, it has to happen. It being a higher price is just, is, these are the prices we need to balance supply and demand, you're saying? Yes, absolutely, because, you know, again, people say, oh, my gosh, well, we're going to have alternative energy and technology is going to fix this. Well, that's great. Technology ultimately will. I don't dispute that, but it's going to fix it a lot farther into the future than we think. And let me give you an example as to why. You know, even if we have a perfectly fungible substitute for petroleum products today, for oil today, 
there are some 60,000 industrial processes that are uniquely dependent on petroleum-based products. Every single one of those has got to be changed over. And the most, even the most optimistic scientists that I've talked to say that's going to take 30 years. Yep. So, you know, oil is still going to be in demand. It's not going away. We're using more of it, particularly if you go to the emerging markets. You go to China, you go to Africa, you go to parts of Asia, other parts of Asia, South America. They've never known expensive energy because they haven't had energy. So, you know, a, an average guy driving his car for the first time is not going to care that that's what it takes to get oil. The guy burning his generator in Africa isn't going to care what it costs him to run it beyond a certain point because he's going to be producing electricity for his village or being able to draw water from the well for the first time. There are other marginal inputs to the value equation that, in my mind, far exceed the price. So I think oil is going to be sharply higher in the years ahead. Well, you know, the the I, I have a larger report which I'm working on around uh, what the truth is behind the, all these fracking stories, and, and the truth is we have liberated some more oil. But the difference between drilling a well that starts out at 400 barrels per day and then rapidly tails off uh, to 100 barrels per day or less. Uh, is not equivalent in any way, shape, or form to a well that we drill in the Guar field, and we poke it down a thousand measly feet, and all this oil comes out under pressure. It's extraordinary. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. You know, these back in uh, shale plays drill down ten thousand, turn it sideways, drill another ten thousand. It's twenty thousand foot well, and you're getting hundred barrels a day. The economics work. Uh, the energy return is still there, but it's not the same landscape we used to live in. Not even right. remotely close. Right. Yeah. Not even. That's that's the key. Not even remotely close. And so it's a different world, and and that's that's the thing I think I object to most when I see all these articles about energy independence because they're not so subtly saying, "Don't worry, we can continue to live exactly as we've been living." I guess we were just worrying our pretty little heads about nothing, and that's really ignoring the complexities involved. And you don't have to scratch that hard to actually find the complexities, uh, and, and even understand that. A world where we can't seem to drill that stuff. And here's something most people miss. Those wells, we knew how to frack 20 years ago. We knew how to horizontal drill 20 years ago. What we didn't have 20 years ago was oil reliably over 75 a barrel, which is what it costs to get the drillers interested to go after those plays. So we live in 75 oil now. Well, in my understanding too, Chris, and I might be completely wrong on this, but my understanding uh, is that we also didn't have the pressure-based technology needed to inject all the other crap into the system that, that makes fracking, fracking possible. Well, we're getting better at that stuff, and we can do these glorious 20-stage frack processes now, which, which we've gotten better at. So there's been some refinement of the art. But it, even with all of that beautiful technology, you take oil back down below 50 a barrel, and guess how many of those wells are being drilled? Exactly. You're going to have huge stagnation in the field, and, and people are going to let their resources go because they're, it's not going to be profitable to operate them. Right. So we just structurally live in a world where, yes, there might be more oil, but at what price? I mean, if oil goes to infinity per barrel, guess what? There's a lot of it out there. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, can you run uh, an ever-expanding credit-based system where you need more debt piling up, and this was the key to me, piling up at a faster rate than the economy, that is, your income stream was growing? Yeah, that that exponential curve, you know, as you and I discussed in our video, you know, that, that there is... There is no way that is sustainable. It is, it is a mathematical impossibility that it sustains itself. At some point, it crashes and burns. And, you know, that's one of the things that I think is really tough right now is people are hearing those terms. They hear about these stories. They've deliberately put on the blinders. And, you know, oh, my gosh, I don't want anybody to interfere with my reality. I like it just fine. Kick me in the butt when it's over. Mm -hmm. Well, those people are going to be sadly disappointed when somebody finally does kick them in the butt and they find out they've been left behind. Because if you do invest through this, you know, you have an opportunity to actually build legendary wealth. You can protect your assets. You don't have to be taken to the cleaners again uh, when all of this happens. Yeah, and, you know, surprisingly, I, I do run into um, some people who feel that somehow profiting from all of this is, is immoral or uh, uh, amoral at best. And, and I look at it, and I think we're in a multi-decade period of adjustment. I don't think this is all going to end next Tuesday at eight thirty-one in the morning. Um, no, just... I agree with that. This is, you know, this is this concept of, you know, here in the United States, long term to a U.S. businessman or a politician is next week. You know, mm -hmm. in Asia, for example, I've seen hundred-year business plans personally. So, mm -hmm. you know, they have a much different perspective of things. They've been around a few thousand years longer than we have. And I think that people need to understand that time is a transition process, and it's not going to be anything close or short. 
Isn't that funny? So it turns out we really have to start thinking temporarily in a whole new way. And at the same time, uh, there's no more time value to money. So it creates a quite a pressure point there for, I it's mean, how do you navigate? Yeah. How do you navigate? And so that's what you do professionally is you help people navigate uh, this uh, this uncertain territory. How do, how do people follow you more closely if they're interested in um, this view? Well, thank you for asking. I think the, the easiest thing to do is to join the family of readers at moneymorning.com. And, you know, we have, as, as you mentioned at the onset of the show, we have more than 500,000 people every day in 35 countries reading our, our work. And, you know, there's, there's a couple things that they need to think about, five of them actually, and I, I put these in, in all of what we do. Number one is they've got to think safety first. These markets are no longer about the return of your money the return, or the return on your money. They're about the return of your money. Mm-hmm. So you've got to think safety first to produce a proper concentration of investments and dramatic stability and consistent returns because that's the twin problem you face is a deficit and a slow to no growth environment over the next 10, 20 years as we deleverage. The second thing you've got to do is you've got to think about offense and defense at the same time. Those two things are not equal, and so the best uh, the best choice for me or the best choice for our readers is companies I refer to as global. These are global companies with highly localized presence. Typically, they've got world recognized brands, diversified revenue streams, asset like you know just absolutely fortress like balance sheets and experience management. And if it comes to placing my trust in a government that's run by academics and people with no experience in money, or if it's uh, real businessmen who are charged with making a profit and returning it to their shareholders. I'm going with the businesses and the shareholders and the profits every single time. And then third thing you want to do is you want to emphasize income because studies show that up to 90% of total returns over time come from dividends and reinvestment. You know, you've got to have that. Growth is an illusion that's perpetuated by financial leverage. Therefore, you've got to stick to those things that pay you, particularly in a zero interest rate environment, for the risk that you're taking. You've got to build in discipline. That's number four. Built-in safety breaks. This is not that hard to do, but the, the thing is most people won't do it because they've been led down this merry path of set it and forget it. You know, buy and hope is not a marketing strategy. It's, it's you know, an investment strategy. It's a marketing gimmick. And so you've got to structure yourself in such a way that you're not taken over the cliff, fiscal or otherwise, if you mess up. And then finally, you've got to remove emotion. Um, most investors are actually their worst enemy because they second-guess each other and they fall in love with their assets. And when things are very, very scary like they are now, they would rather stick their head in the sand instead of understanding that history shows beyond any shadow of a doubt that the time to build wealth and the time to begin thinking about making dramatic change is when the markets themselves are scared stiff and in dramatic state of flux. And that's where we are now. And as part of that, you got to have resources because if we're going to argue on the assumption that or discuss on the assumption that Bernanke and all the central bankers are going to continue to print money as long as they can humanly do it, then that presupposes you need a combination of stocks to catch the stimulus and to compensate for the inflation it creates, and you also need the real assets to preserve the value that's going to be lost when those things work their way into the system. In those real assets, what are you talking about there? Well, that's the obvious stuff. That's the gold, the silver, the rice, the corn, the sugar, the oil. Uh, you know, energy to me, even though sometimes electrical generation, you know, people don't consider that a commodity, but it is a commodity because the world needs it. It's not just a, uh, it's nice to have, it's a must have. And so there, you want to think in my mind as we go through this great financial, uh, upheaval, you want to shift your thinking from what's nice to have to what does the world have to have. And that's the difference. Interesting. So the summary of this is this isn't your grandfather's market anymore, is it? No, it really isn't. And, you know, I talk, as you know, with tens of thousands of investors a year at presentations around the world. And if there's one thing I want them to take away is that this is not the financial market you grew up with. You cannot apply the same old tired tactics using models that are very clearly broken and expect different results. You have to change your mindset, and you have to look for profit, protection, and potential all at the same time. Fantastic advice. Well, we've been talking with Keith Fitzgerald. You can find out more at moneymorning.com. Keith, it's been a real pleasure. I appreciate your time, and you've been very gracious. The questions were brilliant, and I enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I hope we can do this again. I do, too.